All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Brian Bathurst. I'm a developer with the Pulp team um, at Red Hat. And uh, this talk is about multi-tenancy and it's a step towards Pulp as a service. Um, if you wanted to run Pulp as a service, like um, on a kind of large web property, you would need to serve, um, likely serve multiple tenants. So um, let's go ahead and uh, get into the agenda. Please, uh, if you have questions, feel free to just unmute and ask them. If you have comments as well, same thing. Um, if you're watching this later on YouTube, feel free to leave comments in the chat. We'll try to see those. And um, we can also have some questions at the end and discussion there if it's helpful. We're going to start by talking about um, just what is multi-tenancy. Um, then we're going to identify kind of a series of problems about why Pulp at this um, point in its history is not, um, cannot accurately claim that it is prepared to be run as a multi-tenant system. Um, and then with each of these problems, I have a few ideas um, about, hey, here's a possible resolution to it. Um, and then at the end, uh, there's two kind of overarching ideas, and those are a little bit more about kind of, how would you implement this broadly in Pulp? Um, uh, so that's our agenda. Why don't we dive right into it? What is multi-tenancy? Um, these are quotes from the Wikipedia page. I feel like they describe it pretty succinctly, but um, it's a, I mean, I really try to avoid reading slides, but in this case, it's a quote, so I think it's worth it. Um, a single instance of software, uh, which runs on a server and serves multiple tenants. So that kind of begs the question, okay, well, what do we mean by the word tenant? And they uh, define it as a tenant is a group of users who share common access with specific privileges to the software instance. So, um, uh, to get, they go on to say um, it's designed to provide every tenant a dedicated share of the instance, so some portion of the pulp feature set there, including its data, its configuration, its user management, and tenant individual functionality. And when they talk about tenant individual functionality in the pulp context, I think of it as um, my re my repositories, my um, ability to trigger syncs, my um, basically usage of of pulps functionality um, and pulp is an API web service. So I can think about that as, you know, how can we provide tenant to tenant isolation around each and every API endpoint um, and the data that flows um, across those API endpoints. So let's go ahead and into the problems um, that one would experience if they wanted to set up pulp and provide it with various tenants. Um, and I also want to point out that in a lot of cases, these tenants uh, do not trust each other, and we need to assume that they actively don't trust each other. I mean, I don't think that's necessarily the way it is, <laughs> um, because most people just don't care about other people using the big cloud infrastructure. But um, it's critically important, likely for business reasons, that isolation and privacy be a paramount concern. So I always try to think of it as these people really don't trust each other, and they need to make sure that they're isolated. So one issue is that the role-based access control, um, AKA RBAC, uh, is, uh, or airbag as I've heard it said previously, um, is not done yet. Um, and RBAC will be a big step forward. So the state of RBAC right now, um, th there's like a little working group. I'm pretty sure Matthias, um, is more or less leading the effort and doing a great job um, along with everybody helping out. Um, what it, It's adding this concept of roles formally to Pulp Core and plugins will be able to assign certain permissions for authorization of actions um, to, as a role, um, to, to that role. So for example, um, and this is not available yet, but RPM, um, when RPM receives role-based access control, you could define a role, which is a con concept of something like, uh, I am a repository admin or repository owner. And for this role, you have the ability to create repositories and trigger syncs on repositories if you also have access to a remote and maybe that's included in the role or not. But um, you can imagine that, uh, 
at least from a conceptual level, um, having role-based access control and authorization to correctly enforce it will um, go a long way towards creating safety in between differing groups. Um, particularly as um, role-based access control provides a notion of object level ownership. So it's, uh, and it also provides global ownership as a concept, but from a conceptual level, um, the object level one's really important for, you know, helping make pulp uh, a multi-tenant safe system because um, it say that I'm a RPM, for example, uh, I have, I'm, I'm a role, I'm, an, I'm a repo owner. Well, when I make a repository, um, I receive the permissions to own it. But if another user um, made their repository, I don't have permissions to, to administrate that one. So our back itself is providing a good level of isolation. Um, and it's, and there, the second bullet here is, and I wanna really make sure this is clear, um, it provides query set isolation. So um, if you have two users, user A and user B, and um, one of them were to create a RPM repository, assuming that RPM has, were to have RBAC fully completed, um, and user A creates an RPM repository uh, foo, and user B creates an RPM repository bar, and then user A and user B go to list the RPM repositories on the system, this query set isolation is going to look at the read permissions that um, that user has for all RPM repositories known by Pulp, and it's only gonna show them the ones that it has access to. And so, in terms of isolation, that is a very, that is a large portion of it. Um, and so this slide more or less to say is that um, role-based access control is the single largest thing that Pulp needs to complete in order to, to prepare for um, multi-tenancy. Um, it's not enough. There's a variety of other problems that I'll talk, talk about here in a minute, but um, this query set isolation isolates data. And also, even if, you know, just because you can't see the data, like if I can't see the RPM repository from another user, um, it also provides enforcement of authorization. So I can't just go around it to like, oh, just because I, you know, like um, being secure through being hidden or being obscure, um, the role-based access control will prevent um, the, uh, you know, unauthorized queries from acting on data that isn't theirs. So. Um, it's probably a longer explanation than is needed. The, that this is quite a clear and simple concept, but it's so important to create an isolation that I really wanted to make sure that it was explained, um, even without much context into what's happening with the um, role-based access control effort that's already underway. Um, we are hoping to have uh, the role-based access control, which is already um, opened up on GitHub as a PR, um, merged into the next pulp core release and then there will be some time after that that pulp plugins will need to um, configure that so it will be a few releases for sure until this is done we've been waiting for this for a long time so i don't want to advertise you know a short timeline it will not be quick but um, it is very important so we're going to be doing it um so so robust access control is a big part of the problem and we got to fix that Another part of the problem is that content is global. And this is something that at least our current trajectory for roles will not resolve uh, for role-based access control. So the issue here is that content is global inside of Pulp, so content doesn't have an owner. And if you go, and there are um, these view sets and views in Pulp that will let you list content. So for example, I can go and list all the file content in a system, or I can go and list all of the um, RPM content in the system. And you know, if we look at if we look at like the API in Pulp Core, uh, you know, we can probably see like here. Here's the one for file. I'm going to list file content. Pulp API v3 content file file. Which is I'm sure really hard to read. Um, 
So when you list this endpoint, you'll get back all the content in pulp and it has no owner. And our plans right now do not address this uh, problem. So, uh, and, and it's a serious problem. Let's talk about how serious the problem is. So um, if you wanted to access content that isn't yours, and again, our assumption here is that users and tenants, really tenants don't trust each other. Um, you, you, uh, it would be a bad situation if one user could access content that uh, isn't theirs that another user has. And so um, one way to do that with the current situation, this is really the problem statement in detail, uh, have pulp sync from a source with the same uniqueness constraint for that piece of content. So for example, uh, tenant Alice has passwords baked into a collection. Um, uh, it's called this collection foo bar one version one, two, three. Um, collections have a triplet of uniqueness constraint. Um, so uh, the name is foo, the, the namespace, uh, which is a, a metadata field for a particular collection object is bar and then its version is one, two, three. So uh, we just call it foo bar one, two, three. And that's how Pulp thinks about that piece of content uniquely. And then along comes tenant Eve and tenant Eve is evil. And uh, she creates a fake collection named foo bar one, two, three. It doesn't have the same binary data. In fact, it has like almost nothing in it. Um, it's just that uh, it's just that it's um, named foo bar one, two, three. And those are the, again, that's the uniqueness constraint for this example for, for collection content, which is one of the content types in pulp. For RPMs, for example, it would be the Nevera, the namespace, epoch, version, um, release, architecture. Uh, so same, same, same on that side or any content type, whatever that uniqueness constraint is. Anyways, uh, so Eve then syncs into her repo uh, from the fake data that she created. So this is not the real foobar123. And then up at the same time, because Pulp's this big deduplicating machine, Pulp's like, oh, I already have this. And indeed, it puts Alice's actual foobar-123 binary data into Eve's repo, and effectively, Eve just stole the data from Alice. Um, same problem, only now in reverse. You could falsify content for others. And it's the same process, only the order changes. So whoever gets there first is the first um, you know, uh, tenant to create that binary data inside Pulp. And Pulp's like, oh, this is foobar123 forevermore. So um, in this case, Eve uh, goes first and creates a fake collection um, and say it has, it has it's just like the real foobar123 that's out in the wild somewhere. Like in RPMs, it would be from like one of the big RPM distro web properties or, or in collections, it would be from like Galaxy or Ansible.com. But oh wait, the binary data has malware in it. It's hidden deep down. It's very difficult to find. So uh, in this case, Eve creates this fake malware nasty piece of content, syncs it into her repo, uh, and now Pulp thinks that's the real foobar123. And then Alice comes along later and syncs from a trusted source. Um, this is, should be one, two, three. And syncs from a trusted source that has the real foobar123. And Alice trusts that source. So that's where the real binary data should come from. And Pulp says, oh, I already have this. And all of a sudden, Alice has received the malware version from Eve. So um, it is not safe to because content is global. So what we would need to do, and this is the idea here, is extend the RBAC permissions to content objects also. Um, and, and that's an easy thing to say, and it's a hard thing to do, but that's the concept here. I think we should basically um, have the permissions created using the same permissions machinery that we use for everything else, and um, you know, when you go to sync data, when you go to sync. We'll need to not only check, you know, like Pulp's view of what content is in the system needs to be, needs to use queries out isolation to determine. Oh, I do already have this, but it also needs to take special care to make sure that when I'm receiving the binary data, that I'm receiving 
if it's identical, like SHA-256 wise, that's fine. Um, if it's different, then we'll need to handle that case somehow. So um, this is a conceptual hand-waving proposal at best. Um, so after, I think that's probably the biggest problem that I don't have like an immediate, like believable convincing plan, at least to convince myself. Um, so we'll have to work hard to get the content part right. So there are some other problems here. I don't think they're quite as serious or as large, but here's, here's what they are. Um, so the names are global. Uh, this is more of a usability problem. Two tenants and pulp cannot create, both create a repository with the name production. Um, this has to do with the unique equals true in the database. Um, this is true for a lot of different things, not just repositories, but anywhere that we use this in our database, um, this is, you can see here on the, on the repository. So every repository and every plugin is a subclass of this. So, um, so basically uh, two users could not create them named production. So the, the and this is interesting because uh, w due to query set isolation, like if, if one user makes a repo after our back has provided query set isolation, if one user makes a repo and says, my name's equal production, and then the other, <laughs> another user lists the system, um, they don't have permissions onto that user, that first user's um, uh, repository. So they're like, oh, it's not in use. Let me name it production. <laughs> and then even though they think it's not in use, the database on the back end is going to reject that, saying that there's already one named production. And then you go to list it again, and you're like, well, where is it? Um, so it's kind of, it's, not only, um, you know, it's it's not only not great from a usability perspective in terms of getting what you want, but it's also not great because it's very going to be very confusing. Um, so, it's the same for remotes and all objects. Pretty much all the objects that have a name, and maybe even other attributes where unique equals true are going to have the same problem. So, a couple of ideas. Um, couple of not great ideas, actually. Uh, one is we could add an internal tenant namespace, and we could hide this from the tenant. So this would be like um, the field stays unique in the database, but every time you go to make one, we make it instead of production, it would be like, it would be like this, ASDF colon production, <laughs> which where ASDF is like some tenant identifier, and this is the one for them, and this namespace keeps all the names uh, unique. Um, the, this idea up here is let's do that, only let's hide it from the tenants, and that's probably a bad idea. Because um, one, we end up mutating a lot of data, which is not great. But two, um, it can be confusing as we serialize and deserialize data where we hand data back to them, they hand it back to us. Um, maybe we'll get that wrong somewhere in the middle and um, end up like double, double namespacing it or something like that. I think if our implementation was correct, it would work. But anyways, there's an idea. Um, add a namespace and hide it to make it make it pretty. Uh, the second idea is a variation on the first. Um, I think it's my best proposal to solve this problem, which is add a namespace and just show it. It's fine. Um, people can people can deal with there being an ASDF on the front of a multi-tenant system. I think. Um, the third idea is remove the uniqueness constraint and let query set filtering just handle it. Um, but this is probably not a good idea, uh, particularly since you can have situations where user A creates a, a repo with the name prod, and user B does also, and that's fine because they're different users with distinct sets of permissions. But oh, wait, somebody modifies permissions and gives special permissions to this user named C who gets read permissions for both, and now there are multiple ones. Um, I guess there could be a fourth idea, which I didn't put here, which is just not worry about uniqueness. But that creates challenges for the CLI, for instance, which um, uses allows users to express their object of interest. Like, I want to sync this repository by name. And so you know, I think we put those kinds of usages at risk if we start to allow um, names to not be unique. So uh, anyways, the there's this like global naming issue, and that, that's going to be a problem. 
and we should probably use name spaces. Um, this is a this is a, another variation on that problem, but it's a very important part of it, which is that the distribution URL namespace is global. Um, <clears throat> there are other, well, th th here's the problem. Um, two tenants can't both create a distribution with overlapping paths. So um, tenant A names their base path on their distribution prod. Tenant B would then be prevented from making a base path, path equal to prod or prod slash bar or prod slash whatever. Um, because there's a portion of the um, base path that is overlapping. So it's not that they're equal, it's that any portion can't overlap. Um, and the, this problem exists because it's very important that they don't overlap and Pulp enforces this today um, if you try to make it because um, when the content goes to be served by Pulp and the request comes in and says, I want content slash foo slash bar, um, if there were two distributions that both started with foo, we don't know which repository they really want. Um, and so the content app as it walks the, the path to serve content back to users has to have a unambiguous time at it. And so that's why we can't have these overlapping base paths. Um, so you could end up with this really na nasty case where Evil Eve comes along and makes 26 base paths, base paths A, B, all the way through Z, and now no one can use Paul. Um, so same idea here uh, as before. It's the only idea I think that plays that I can think of maybe. I mean, certainly there are um, other ideas and we should talk about them at some point, but we can add a namespace. This is that same idea. Let's just use namespaces. Um, and so every time you go to make uh, you know, your base path prod or production, what you're really going to get is ASDF slash production, where ASDF is some sort of a tenant ID. Um, same idea. Uh, another problem is all settings.py are shared. Uh, so currently tenants, and if we look back at the definition of multi-tenancy, I didn't actually think about this one until I looked at the Wikipedia definition, but it includes um, isolation around configuration. and. We do that for some things, but we don't do it for anything that's in settings.py because those are global configurations. So all tenants cannot have different values or any two tenants cannot have different values for authentication because you know, if you want to hook Pulp up to like Kerberos, everyone's hooked up to Kerberos. If you want to hook it up to any identity management system, everyone's now hooked up to it. So um, that's just how Django and DRF work. And um, that's the state of things. So at least everybody, I, th I think this is something that we should just accept. Um, and the large web property is likely going to be connected to a large, you know, like open ID based auth system anyway. So you're probably going to be able to sign in through a variety of social identities anyway. And that's probably the right decision for a large web property. So, you know, or if you're at a university and you're serving you know, N uh, departments. Well, everybody's part of the university and the university has a big auth system. So I don't think this is a big problem, but it's, so I don't think we should try to solve this problem, but it is a thing. Um, then you have other things like allowed content checksums uh, and allowed import paths and export paths. And these, I looked through the settings file and tried to think about which settings would be problematic where users would practically speaking want different values. And these are the three that I came up with. Um, and maybe allowed content checksums is the big one. Um, by default, Pulp disallows use of SHA-1 and MD5 in terms of validating, check, validating content um, checksums. And so, you know, that prevents you from syncing things like rel, some rel5 or el5, centos5 um, repositories if you're an RPM user. And so if you want to sync those things, you just have to accept that you will need to use an insecure checksum value and you configure pulp at the settings level to allow that. Well, what you've just done on a multi-tenant system is you've enabled that those insecure checksums for all users. So I think of all the ones here, this is this is probably the most concerning one. 
which I don't think is necessary. I mean, my personal opinion is that's not something we should try to solve. Um, people shouldn't use insecure checksums. And uh, that means that unless those content types are able to fix their use of insecure checksums, all users on these multi-tenant systems should um, just use the same thing. But if this, if users feel differently, I understand, let us know. And um, maybe we can talk about some ideas here. Uh, as a general strategy though, going forward, and we, I think we've kind of done this pretty well, severely limit what goes into settings.py. Um, it is not a great place for things. And we've done this pretty well overall. Um, for instance, like configuring alternate content sources. Like in Pulp 2, you actually did that through configuration files. But in Pulp 3, it's done, it's done through an API and users and groups. And there's a lot of examples where we've opted to use APIs instead of setting stuff high. So we should keep doing that. That's a good strategy, I think. Um, one idea is we can move some settings to be user isolated. Like if that's what we would do with allowed content checksums, if we ended up in a position where there's a good use case for having it be set tenant by tenant, that would be fine. That's definitely the realm of possibility. Um, here's another problem. There's no worker content or API isolation. So um, all tenants have equal access to the different services that are you know, comprised pulp. So the API services, content serving, or the tasking workers. So tenant workloads can greatly affect each other. It's not that you could steal data, but you could definitely interfere with other folks' um, workloads. So um, you know, a Evil Eve comes along again and dosses everyone's use of pulp by dispatching crazy amounts of all the things. And um, I think we'll use, I don't have an idea listed here, but I think the idea generally is rate limiting is a good thing. And if you're gonna have a multi-tenant system, rate limiting is almost certainly something that you'll have to address. So the, we probably as a project should um, have some recommendations for simple uh, configurable rate limiting, likely using things that we don't have to make. Um, we probably will have to, you'd probably do it at the API level. And there's a lot of rate limiting facilities built into the reverse proxy software we use already, either Apache or Nginx. So we'll just probably use that. Um, so those are all the problems I'm happy to say that I could come up with. I'm sure there are more and I'm sure we'll find some more. Um, so here are two ideas that I wanted to express. Um, this is a little bit more about implementation. So uh, if you want, right now, this query set isolation that I mentioned for role-based access control is implemented in um, the Git objects, which is part of the Django REST framework machinery. And that's fine for what it is. It prevents you from viewing, you know, like when you say, list me all the things of this type, it provides the isolation there, and that's part of DRF. Um, but we probably want it in not just there, but in a lot of places, like, you know, not just in listing DRF results, but in tasking code that goes to interact with, um, with objects in the database. Like when you go to run queries through the Django ORM, pretty much anywhere you're using the Django ORM, frankly, is where you want queries isolation. So. Um, what we can do, you know, we could just add it literally everywhere you do the ORM queries, <laughs> like chain on the limit by my objects somewhere in there, but this will be very difficult and a lot of work and there's a large number of places to do it. So what will be better, I think, is to um, consider adding it to the managers. So at least that way, instead of, you know, probably thousands of places where we use the Django ORM, you can do it in maybe the 50 model types and the managers associated with every model. Um, that would just be a better implementation. So this is an implementation idea. Um, but that's doing it in Django and that's good. But one other idea is to use, um, wait, did I mess up my slides here? Uh, 
Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, I'm just um, not reading my content correctly here. So, uh, the idea of putting it into managers is what some folks kind of term as row level security. Um, if you read about multi tenant Django, I, um, you know, practices, you'll you'll hear about people using query set isolation in the managers to do that. So, this is the idea, more or less, that I was just talking to. But there is another idea which is also this term row level security and Django actually, I'm sorry, Postgres itself has a feature for this, Postgres 9.5, um, which is uh, old enough that I believe that everyone has this feature available to them. So um, what you can do is basically teach, you can teach Postgres a policy um, which could um, in theory be because I haven't POC'd this or anything, but in theory, we could teach Postgres how to um, apply in Postgres the um, more or less the uh, interpretation of what objects a user should have read or write access to based on the permissions they have, which is data that's also contained in Postgres. And you can see here that this is um, like a little example of a policy and ours would just be a more complex version of this. Um, and this might be a good idea. It might be a really bad idea. Um, it's definitely not the kind of thing that we want all installations to have enabled on them because um, it could, every time you go into the database, I mean, despite Postgres's incredible optimization and just general amazement that I have in using it, um, it's a lot of query load. And so unless you want multi-tenant isolation, I probably wouldn't try to do this. And this might be amazing in the sense that if you can just get this right, you could isolate, you could do query set isolation on the database side and your Django code wouldn't ever even have to think about it. Um, like at you know, the database itself, you try to, for instance, look at authorization Yes, we can still authorize views and everything the way we do now, but even if that wasn't implemented correctly, if you go to issue an update, it's like an update of what? Because the database, as far as your view into it is concerned, that object isn't there. Um, so anyways, I think we should explore this. It's pretty slick. Um, and we need a way to do it that works for not multi-tenant installations too. This is the part I think is important that you know, uh, something that Ansible, the tagline that I've heard used in the Ansible community that I really like is make the easy things easy and make the hard things possible. And so what I don't want, this is in the hard things category, I think multi-tenant systems. Um, I don't wanna make the easy things hard at the expense of making the hard things possible. So normal installations, I think should have all this stuff disabled by default. And that is my presentation. Uh, we can have some discussion now or questions if that's helpful. First question I see from Grant. And so yeah, first of all, Brian, outstanding. I mean, just this this covered a lot of the a lot of the problems, um, a lot of the issues involved. And I'm really interested in the the Postgres solution because one thing about multi-tenancy is as soon as you open up your installation to that your your users your tenants are going to want guarantees that my data can't be seen by evil eve who's in the partition right next to me and doing it at the postgres level allays a lot of those fears um, um so i'm really interested in in pursuing that and when you feel like there's some time for you to start a poc let me know and we can we can whiteboard the hell out of it um one thing that we have experienced doing multi-tenancy because I've done it in other other lifetimes, both at Red Hat and in previous places, is there, there are kind of three qualitatively different kinds of tenants. There's the individual user who wants to own their the pieces that they're creating. Users often, but not always, belong to what has been called varying things from, from, uh, from tenant although user is a tenant in some ways, um, or organizations or companies or whatever, 
And somebody at that level wants to say, okay, my users control their data, but I also have a, a view into them and I also get to limit things. So if I am, if I'm company FUBAR, my users can create repos, but if their repo names collide, then they don't, you know, the, the, the last person doesn't get it. And how do they complain about that? They come to me and I straighten it out. Um, and then above that qualitatively differently is the person who owns the actual installation who's going to get yelled at when things go wrong, when when denial of service attacks happen or run out of disk, or you know they control the memory and the processors and the the disk drives. Um, the so it's the super admin, if you will, and to fix things in their installation, they have to have visibility to everything. So that's like a super root level of permissions, um, and there there are three wildly different use cases. Um, that we need to think about as we as we go down this path in terms of yeah. how we solve those. Uh, and I'm just reading Danny's Danny's comment. Because yeah, me too. Thanks, Danny. I'm gonna check this out. It's big, but it looks like it covers a lot of stuff here. Um, uh, yeah, so um, uh, one of the things that um, I believe at least is that uh, we should really be tying the inf the ability to view and edit data to the role-based access control in a very deep and tight way because what you've described, Grant, I think is very typical, um, and that's that's good. But there's going to be other installations out there where they don't want that. You know, like I don't know. There's some other there's some other thing, and so um, to the extent that we can be less uh, prescriptive around. Um, the roles, like we'll ship default roles, but you know, if, if people can go in and edit the roles and the objects that those roles apply to and have the multi-tenantness um, provide really excellent isolation based on that, I think that would just be a big design win. Um, and the other thing I, I meant to share in my talk and I didn't was, um, uh, so if you look at AWS Code Artifact, which is um, the service that effectively um, is like Amazon's um, version of Pulp, uh, totally different code base is my understanding, but anyways, um, extreme amount of similarities. Uh, you'll see that in their top levels, I just put a link to it here in the chat, their top level thing has this thing called a domain. And thanks to Daniel Alley for his feedback on pointing out their use of domain um, basically, you can read domain in their documentation as what I call here a tenant ID. Um, and one of the things I really struggle with is conceptualizing how to manage tenant IDs. Um, like user management, okay, that's, we, we understand. We have API facilities for that, but we just don't have anything for tenant IDs. Um, Matias, I see your hand raised. Or someone who's um, yeah. in your in your spot. I just wanted to ask um, this database isolation. Is it that it looks like a different database installation for each different tenant? So whenever you look log in as a specific user, you are kind of connected to a database, and you don't see, and you aren't able to change any other places. That's correct. That's my so understanding. Thing, and so the only thing we need to um, Additionally, adjust is the uh, content app serving at different locations and the um, uh, data storage to not collide on any artifacts. Yeah, pre pretty much. Like it's um, my understanding is that like if you connect to um, PG SQL or whatever the client Postgres binary name is, which I maybe I'm not remembering right, but um, and you do like a select star, like at the DB level for a table, it, it's gonna show you a limited view of the data. So it is a it is a true database isolation technique and it's tied to your, um, your identity as a login. And what I think that we need to do is be careful about connection, like a, a large connection turnover. Like we don't, if we go down that route, I would worry about um, reconnecting all the time. Uh, so I, I think that we should have a way to um, auto-escalate 
for every query run, let's make sure this is the right identity without actual um, RTT, TCP set up, tear down for the, or re-auth at the connection level. That's more good user saying, session. Are you saying the manager is always looking at the Postgres user you're connecting with, or can you um, provide the user by making the query with the same, uh, by using the same uh, account on Postgres every time? So in learn in in my reading of the row level security, it's that former thing. They want you to connect with a user and user A and user B are connected and authenticated to Postgres differently. But what I think we need is that latter thing um, where we can have a single connection to the database with user pulp and um, escalate to the that that particular DB session to use isolation in some way. So, but again, I haven't worked with it, so I should probably stop my theoretics right now. But yeah, that's the idea. That's my concern is like, what we don't want to do with this real level security stuff is have to now maintain all the identity management stuff in the database. Like we do not want to do that. Um, any other uh, questions for Ian? Um, yeah, I think you're working on your audio. I cannot hear you well. Perhaps Grant while Florian is or... oh. Yeah, Grant, uh, Florian, if you did, oh, yes. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, I'm glad, Florian, thank you for saying this in the chat. Um, and you know, this is a, that's a very different way to skin the cat and maybe that's what we should be doing. Um, I think that's a totally valid perspective. Uh, Brian, can you share what exactly is written for the sake of others? Yes, yes, oh yes, of course. Um, yeah, so what Florian is, is asking is, um, why not put the effort into the Kubernetes operators capabilities which have um, existing multi-tenancy? Um, effectively, the pulps, this isolation approach here would be um, to have Kubernetes deploy a pulp for each tenant. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then we can use, uh, Forian goes on to say, then tenants get their own instances, and then we can use the time uh, that, that we get back to nail down the RBAC systems um, and really focus on making our RBAC a great. Maybe we should do that. I mean, that's. Thank you, thank you very much for suggesting that. We absolutely need to consider this. So one of the things, actually, I, I'll because my I had a question, but Florian, your comment talks directly to the thing that that has occurred to me. One of the the things that's easy to miss about providing multi-tenancy is it means your users start looking at Pulp, going, "Oh, I could run ten different companies on this one instance." or a hundred different companies or a thousand different companies. And then they start coming to us with, why is nothing scaling? Well, it's because everybody's talking to one Postgres instance. And then you start talking, well, maybe we'll shard the Postgres instance. You start going down this path of how do we make the single instance bigger? Florian's comment here actually addresses that directly. If a single pulp instance isn't multi-tenant in the, the context that we're talking about here there's no temptation to jam as many people into it as you possibly can and if you want data separation you actually have separate instances which guarantees separation right there's the databases aren't even shared um which which makes the scaling story a lot easier because you say if well you you're then now the only time i have to worry about massive performance problems if, is if a single tenant has you know 20,000 repos that they're syncing every day as opposed to I have 10,000 tenants that all have two repos and I'm trying to fit them all into one instance. So one advantage of just of just punting on the whole thing is we don't there's a whole raft of down the road um scaling issues that suddenly we've we've solved by saying you don't make one in, one instance more performant you separate by tenant. Yeah, I mean, I, it's it's so funny because um, like I had thought 
about all these things and I made all these slides and for in your like single one comment has been like, yeah, obviously that's what we should do. That's a, just a way better approach. Um, so excellent. Um, I'm really thankful um, for that because better now than later. Um, the one thing that we end up giving back with that, I, don't, I actually don't think is a big deal, but just to call it out is um, uh, by avoiding having pulp itself solve the strategy, um, the multi-tenant problem is a huge win in a lot of ways. And I think the only way that it's maybe not as helpful is we can't deduplicate the storage across these tenancies. But then again, um, you probably will have billing as an aspect to this, right? And so having users pay for what they use seems correct. <laughs> so I guess I'm not as concerned about that. Um, and also, you, you may be able to dedupe across um, by using storage-based deduplication technologies. Um, you know, call your call your local NetApp uh, salesman. Uh, Neil, thank you for the comments. Actually, I think with your um, role-based or with your Postgres-based isolation, it's even meant to be running multiple. Um, front-end containers on the same database, and then they use different logins to the database and see different versions of the table. So you, if you still want to use that one Postgres database, that's, and you can, uh, again, multiply the, the instances, right? Yeah, you, you can. Um, but I, I still think there's something to be said for just letting Kubernetes solve it. Um, like in, in, in the hole. So um, I see some other hands raised. Uh, Florian, I think your hand is raised, but I think you've said it in chat. Please let me know if that's not the case. Um, and next we'll hear from Daniel. Yeah, I just wanted to point out, um, it's been a while since I've read the AWS uh, Code Artifact docs, but I believe they completely, like everything that's on a separate domain is completely separate. So if they're doing any kind of uh, the duplication, it's all on the storage backend side of things. And so um, I don't think that's actually something that you lose going to that kind of uh, um, uh, if we were to go down that, 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 that route um, uh, that's like either way, even if we went to the um, separating domains on like the pulp side, I think we, we might still lose it there as well. Um, or, or try, if we tried to model that, um, uh, I'm losing my train of thought a little bit, but. Um, yeah, I think what, what I'm hearing is, uh, hey, even if we went the Kubernetes multi-tenant operation, we still may be able to provide some deduplication. Yeah. Um, so I would say the actual use case we maybe lose is, you know, you have, uh, let's say, sub admins who have access to like view um, uh, or, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. I'm going to back off. Yeah, that's no problem. Um, cool. Um, yep. Uh, Ryan, you might be hey, interested David. in some of the work that um, Ansible is doing in this area. We're working on a um, automation platform managed service for Azure. And it sounds like we're going to be doing a similar approach for it with um, uh, OpenShift operators uh, to spin up multiple installations of, aut of automation hub and controller. Yeah, I am definitely interested in that. So um, yeah, let's talk more about it. And I can take the action item to kind of bring it up. And my interest is to do it transparently so that everyone who's interested in collaborating with it on this call and otherwise can um, join that working group as well. So I appreciate you saying that, David. Um, all right, any other questions uh, or comments? Okay, so if we roll back to Monday and we all say what we wanted to get out of PulpCon, I should have said, I want to get out of PulpCon um, an idea that is going to revolutionize a very presentation that I'm giving. So uh, A plus uh, for that. Um, I think we're finished, Melanie, thank you. 
Thank you all very much. Then I stopped the recording. <laughs>